Good evening. Good evening. It's my second day in San Diego, and I'm enjoying it. Hey. Amen. Amen. Appreciate the hospitality and uh, the opportunity and all that. It's a blessing being here. I enjoyed the fellowship of your preacher and his wife, and of course, Brother Andrus and his wife as well. So, need to get started here because I need to make sure that I don't run into Brother Andrus's time, whatever that means. But uh, you know how it goes with. Preachers promising to uh, get on with it. Anyway, <laughs> Exodus chapter 19. I do have uh, some stuff to dump on you tonight here. Um, and uh, there's plenty of places to get distracted and camp and chase rabbits that I probably shouldn't. So I'm going to try to stay on track and move along. Uh, some of this could stretch out and preach for a while, so I don't want to uh, impinge. But Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to start there, and uh, in the third month, verse 1, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. I just wanted you to notice Sinai there. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the uh, desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings. That's what I was talking about last night, preacher. Yeah. And brought you uh, unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. We can pause there and have a word of prayer. Ask Brother Andrus if he'd pray for us, please. Yes. Sing about you, Lord, and have this precious book open so our eyes can see the truths that you wrote there. And thank you, God, for this preacher that has found some truths in here for us to, to see. And I pray, God, that as we mm. see them, that you would give your spirit amongst us so we might understand and grasp them. And, Lord, I pray that you would feed us with the word of God and strengthen our hearts because of it. And, God, as we leave mm. here tonight, it might be a little... A little closer to you, a little yeah. stronger for yeah. you. And build us up in the most holy faith, we pray, and bless your preacher tonight. Amen. Give him wisdom from above, we ask, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All righty, this passage, you know, is uh, the early wanderings of the children of Israel. In fact, they haven't really wandered yet. They're going to, but they don't have to yet. <laughs> but Israel's delivered from Egypt, as you know. It's a type of our salvation. We are the church in the wilderness, or they were. And uh, so it typifies our walk with God. Now, they're brought down to Mount Sinai, as you see in verse 1 and verse 2. And there Israel gets her real introduction face-to-face -face with the God of Israel. He had been, uh, he'd displayed his power aplenty in Egypt, but they went down there and they uh, sat down at the bottom of that mount while it smoked and thundered and roared and so on. There's quite a, quite a light show that went on there. And uh, Moses went on, uh, on up there and fasted 40 days and 40 nights as time, you know, progresses. We'll see that here in a little while. But Israel's carried out to Mount Sinai, and there uh, the God of Israel showed them they were on holy ground. Mount Sinai was Israel's holy ground. I don't think anybody here has a problem with that. So I wanted to say tonight that uh, being a type of our salvation as such... Uh, Mount Sinai also was holy ground for several people, individuals. And I'll point out four of them here for you tonight real quick. I'm going to try to make a case for one or two of them. But first of all, back in Exodus chapter 3, let's go back there. Exodus chapter 3. There are four guys that I believe went to Mount Sinai and... It was holy ground for them. This one is plain for you here. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock uh, uh, to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. A little bit later here, down in verse 5, it says... Uh, Put the shoes off thy feet, for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground, right? Yeah. So, 
Moses is a man that goes and stands on holy ground before God. That holy ground is on Mount Horeb, right? Mount Sinai, it's the same thing. The Mount of God. Now, let me, uh, just, I'll just go ahead and tell you this, and we'll see it later. The second guy that's stated to go to Mount Horeb definitively is uh, Elijah. Remember Elijah? He uh, defeats the 850 prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves. Gets a little bit scared of Jezebel, goes on down. And the Bible says he goes to Horeb, where he too, by the way, Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Elijah too fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And there on that mount, he got to meet God face to face as well. There's another guy, his name is Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't say that he went to Mount Horeb. It does say that he went to a holy mount in 1 Peter. It does say that he goes down there, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness of temp the, the Mount of Temptation. He fasts 40 days and 40 nights, and there he sees, uh, there he meets up with Satan. Is that right? But I believe with all the, the typology and all that, Jesus Christ, a strong case is made for the Mount of Temptation. And by the way, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, being the place, uh, being Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, where Jesus Christ went into the wilderness. He was led of the Spirit into the wilderness at the Mount of Temptation. There he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I think he went to Mount Horeb. Now there's another guy named Paul. And uh, we'll get to all these in time. That's why I'm moving along quickly. But Paul in Galatians chapter 1 said, after he got saved at a certain point, he went to Arabia. And reasonably, that's Mount Sinai, because he does mention Mount Sinai later in Galatians. And so I have four guys I think that I can show went to Horeb, the Mount of God. The first, uh, Moses is said to stand there on holy ground. Generally speaking, Horeb was holy ground for Israel. I think it was holy ground for Moses personally, holy ground for Elijah personally, holy ground for Jesus Christ personally, and holy ground for Paul personally. And so it's on that basis we go forward here. And um, like I said, uh, uh, Israel is the type of the church in the wilderness. It's the, the wilderness walk that you walk now. And so I don't know if you've ever wondered what holy ground is for you. I believe I can make, make a case tonight for some things where uh, maybe what most Christians miss is knowing what holy ground is to God. And so let me run some things past you on this out of these four, four separate men. Again, I have to make a little bit of a case for Jesus Christ because it doesn't state that he went to Horeb. It does state for Paul he went to Sinai in Arabia. So, you know, I can make those cases pretty well, I think. But let's start with Moses here really clear. Exodus chapter 3, down in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. This is Mount Horeb. This is the Mount of God. The Peter calls that the holy mount. And so as... Moses goes up there, the Lord says, put the shoes off your feet, the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. All right? So here Moses is given his commission for the next 40 years of his life. He's now 80 years old. He lives to be 120. His first 40 years were spent in Egypt. His next 40 years were spent in Midian. His next 40 years were spent leading the children of Israel forth into the land of Canaan. Is that right? All right? At 80 years old, he gets his commission. And when he gets his commission, he basically pitches a fit. He ba basically becomes the mule not wanting to move or be led. He says, I can't go. They won't believe me. Oh, I can't speak. He made every excuse in the book. Here's a guy that 40 years before that couldn't wait to lead the children of Israel out. And now when he's given the commission to do so, he said, oh, no, I can't do that. What's the deal with that? Whatever it is, whatever's going on there, the Lord says, get the shoes off your feet. 
for where on the ground whereon thou standest is holy. So we can figure out what Moses' problem was. We might find out for us what holy ground might be to God. So I'll ask you this. Why is this so traumatic for Moses? Why is he ready at 40 years old to go? Now he's 80, and I know he's older. I know a lot of things, but why is he so unwilling to go? I can't go. I can't talk. I can't speak. Oh, they won't believe me, etc., etc., etc. Finally, the Lord gets mad at him. Better get your rear end up and go. <laughs> That's in the Hebrew, by the way. But uh, what is this thing about? Well, I'd like to say that uh, Moses is 80 years old. And you know, uh, so he's uh, two-thirds of the way through his life. Think about that. Uh, if you put it in more like our modern years, uh, if you live to be 90 years old, well, Moses, at the, in thirds, that's 30 years. So Moses at 40 was like some of us at 30. If you're going to live to be 90, don't know if you will or won't, but Moses at 40 was like us at 60. So Moses is getting his commission at 60 years old. And then Moses dies at 120. And so you die at 90. So it's like that with us. And uh, Moses is 80 years old when he finally gets his commission. As a young man, he's done some kind of uh, preemptive things, impetuous things, which we're kind of inclined to do in our youth, right? Yeah. And so here's what happened. In impetuousness, at 40, he kills an Egyptian, loses his temper. That's a character problem. Loses his temper, gets himself in a mess, has to run. In that time, he also thought that Israel, he presumptuously, that's an issue of youth many times that bleeds over into old age. <laughs> There's plenty of old guys that are still plenty presumptuous. But in his presumption, he figured, oh, Israel's going to follow me out. Well, they didn't. They didn't. Um, he turns bitter. I can prove, I think, that he was a little bit bitter at God because after all, when he had two boys, he didn't circumcise one of them. And so it almost cost the boy his life by the time you get to Exodus chapter 4. So he's bitter enough and angry enough at God for that that he... I mean, those boys, if they weren't circumcised, they were not in the covenant of Abraham. So it's a serious thing. So here's Moses. He's impetuous. He's presumptuous. A little bit bitter. A little bit careless. And Mary's a Midianite, which they technically weren't supposed to do. And now he's got a family. He's uh, parked it in Midian, kind of settled in, kind of backslid. And uh, there he is. In the end, he's not in the best shape in the world spiritually, gotten a little bit lax, and at 80 years old, he said, I'm going to go see why the bush is not burnt. Goes up, and the Lord says, kick the shoes off your feet. The ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And Moses says, okay, but I can't go. I mean, I can't go do that. I'm too old. Um, I can't talk. They won't listen to me. And the excuses just kept piling up. What's so traumatic here? What's the problem here? The problem here is that by the time Moses is 80, he has sown some crops that he doesn't want to reap. Those crops, be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's what we all do. Those crops are colliding with his commission. And the Lord says, the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And so when you get to a position where you are a third, halfway, two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through your life, and the Lord shows up and says, i got something I want you to do. And you say, oh, I can't do that. The ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. Because you've sown crops, and because of the crops you've sown, you're making excuses. A man, I'm, you know, in our, if I'm 90 years old, I mean, I'm 62. So I'm not far, you know, proportionally 
where God found Moses when he finally gave Moses his commission. The difference is I've been at it for a while longer. Um, I'm not saying I'm less stubborn. I'm just saying that. It's just <laughs> true. But you know something? Uh, I know this. At 60, two-thirds, if I live to be 90, two-thirds of the way through my life, maybe even more proportionally, I know a man my age can have sown a lot of crops. In fact, I know 30 years old, year olds that have sown a lot of crops. I know 20-year-olds that have sown a lot of crops. Somewhere along the way, what God wants you to do is going to collide with those things. And when, you run, when those things cross and smash together, that is holy ground. Because God's going to find out now whether you're going to let that stop you. And to Him, that's holy ground. You come to be 50 or 40 or 30 or 25 or 18 or 15, Lord comes along and says, oh, i got something I want you to do, and you start making excuses. Oh, Lord, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm in debt up to here. I don't know if I can get away and do that. I don't know if I can go to school. I mean, I'm in debt up to here. i got a career. i got a family. I've had an abortion. I've been to prison. I don't mean I've had an abortion. I'm just saying. <laughs> Some people say that. I've been to prison. Um, by the time you've lived, you know, 30 or 40 years, man, you have some ruts in your character that make it hard for you to serve God. So God brings you this commission in. Maybe you're 20, maybe you're 30, maybe you're 40, maybe you're 60, maybe you're 70. And in that time that you've lived up to that point, either lost or backslidden, I relate to backslidden people, because I was saved for 10 years before I ever did anything for the Lord. So I can relate to what... I did all my sinning after I got saved at 10 years old. I mean, I was a sinner before, but as far as the bad stuff I got into, I did all that after I was saved. So I have a kind of a special place in my heart for saved backsliders. Because <laughs> I know what that's like. I can relate. And so you've sown these crops, you've got bad character, you've taught yourself to be lazy, you've got a bad temper, you know, uh, you're divorced and remarried and you've, you know, smashed one family and working on another and all that kind of stuff. The Lord says, I got something I want you to do. Maybe it's not go lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Maybe it's just that I want you to be a witness. I want you to go to that church and serve there. And you go, oh, I can't do that. And the fact of the matter is you're making excuses because your crops are colliding with your commission, with what God wants you to do. And I just want you to know you can say what you want to say and you can wind up where you're going to wind up, but that is holy ground for God. Or a man has sown the crops and now it's come time where the Lord says, I got something for you to do. And you don't really want to do it because it's going to clash. I mean, do you realize he called Moses back, back to a country where he failed worse than anywhere else in the world? He, went to a, he sent him back to a people who had already refused him. Sent him back to a people where his life had fallen apart. I mean, he killed this Egyptian, had to go on the run. He's an outlaw as far as Pharaoh's concerned. Goes to the backside of the wilderness, marries a country girl and... You know, now they're having babies. But, I mean, he's being called back to the very people, to the very place where he failed worse than any place else in his life. And God says, I want you to go. He says, I don't want to go. Why don't you want to go? Because I can't talk, because they won't listen, because this, because that, because the other, making excuses. Your crops are colliding with your commission. And God says... You better get your shoes off your feet. Because I consider, I mean, I know the Lord's dealing with a location in this passage. But for you, you know that all ground is holy. And so we can't talk about a location. We got to talk about a heartfelt thing. It's where your crops collide with your commission. It's holy ground. So wherever you meet up with what the Lord wants you to do and 
you know, you feel useless, hopeless, unworthy, pathetic, undeserving, and you just can't do it. Lord says, yeah, I know. You failed there once. But now I'm going to help you. This time I called you. Instead of you running out in front of me. This time I called you. And so, you know, what Peter proved was that you ain't fished till you throw the net where the Lord said throw the net. Because they fished all night, didn't catch a thing. But they, when he says, throw it on the other side, Amen. they brought in more than they had for weeks. Amen. So you ain't done it till you've done it at God's behest. Amen. You say, yeah, but I don't want to do it. Yeah, I know, because you've sown crops. You have, a, you have bad character because that's what you've nurtured. You've been lazy. You've been prayerless. You know how pathetically you failed, and so now you don't want to do it. That's holy ground. Your crops are colliding with your commission. Now there's the next guy. Let's go to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Ever wonder what holy ground was for you? Like last night, none of us have ever stood you know, at the foot of a burning bush that's not burnt up. And you're never going to do that. Not literally. So holy ground has to be different for us while still preserving the devotion of the context. All right, 1 Kings chapter 19. I think most people know the story here. Elijah, back in chapter 18, has uh, defeated 850 prophets total prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves, he has whacked all their heads off and there's been a great rain and all that kind of stuff. He gets to chapter 19 and uh, he is uh, threatened, of course, by Jezebel. And of course, I'm in 2 Kings, so I can't uh, read to that anything. Because <laughs> I'm busy yammering instead of turning my Bible. But Jezebel threatens him and for whatever reason, there's a lot of preaching in here that needs to be preached and can't do it tonight, right? But for whatever reason, he abdicates his position and heads to the wilderness because he don't want to put up with that woman. <laughs> and he's a little bit scared, worn out, you know, got some uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or something like that. You would too if you'd hacked 850 prophets to pieces, right? So there's Moses. And uh, the Bible says in chapter 19, verse 8, He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. There he is. He's fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Like Moses did on Mount Horeb. And by the way, in verse 8, where is he? Under Horeb, the Mount of God. Okay. And down there in verse 9, when he arrives, the Lord says, What are you doing here? Right? Right? And so he sings a song. It's a pitiful song in the end. I'm not against Elijah. I'm not trying. I, there's plenty of super positive stuff, but let's face it. His answer, verse 10, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And the Lord says, I didn't say you weren't. For the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant. Yeah, they have. Thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And the Lord says, that's not true. But Moses has got to finish the song. So he says, and they seek my life to take it away. So what happens? Verse 11, he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break, it in, pieces, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord uh, was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle. Now, what's that? He don't like the voice. I'll say more about it in a second, but he's been hiding for the, from that voice for a long time. So here's the voice again. And he does one of these. 
does a Dracula thing. <laughs> what is this? That's in the Hebrew too. Verse 13. It was so when Elijah heard, heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Second time the question's answered. And he sings the same cotton-picking song. He said, I mean, it's the same song. Verse 14, he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. The Lord says, I didn't say you weren't. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And the Lord said, what did I tell you about that? And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. When thou comest, anoint the Haziel to be king over Syria. Okay, good enough. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall uh, thou anoint to be king over uh, Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Melah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And he goes, in my room? He said, yeah, you lost your job. Just now you lost your job. Now, I know he didn't lose his job immediately because he's still around for a while. But something happened there. He sings this song twice, and apparently he wasn't supposed to sing that song the same the second time. There's something that happened between time number one and time number two that was supposed to change his mind. Now, it says down in verse uh, 11... Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. Um, the Lord thunders, and the earth shakes, and the wind rends the rocks. That's a wind. <laughs> and when it's all said and done... Uh, Lord comes to him in a still, small voice. And as soon as he's done talking, he said, Now, tell me again why you're here. And Elijah goes into the song again. And the Lord says, You just lost your job. Something's going on here. Uh, this is the same holy ground that Moses stood on the very same spot, the very same mount. And they've both fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And here they stand with this. And once again, a man is standing on holy ground. And the first time it had to do with your crops colliding with your commission. This time, it's where conscience meets consequences. Because there's a phrase in verse 12 that I didn't understand for a long time. I read it wrong. I was reading it wrong all the time says at the end of the verse, and after the fire, a still small voice. And I used to read it, a still, comma, small voice. That's how I used to read it. Is there a comma there? Okay. I know what a, a small voice is, but I was reading it as a still and small voice. So what's a still voice like? Yeah. It's not... The, the still voice doesn't have anything to do with being in one place. It, it's the way we use the word still. It was always small, yeah. and it's still small. It has to do with the time element. In other words, God had been dealing with Moses about, I'm sorry, Elijah, about this Elijah complex he'd had for a long time. In his heart, he'd been singing this song for a long time. I, I'm the only one doing anything for God. I only, I, and they hate me. Oh, woe is me. You might as well kill me because nobody else is doing the job. The Lord says, I got news for you, pal. And for a long time, the Lord had been whispering in a small voice. And that day on the mountain, the wind rent the rocks. The earthquake shuddered and shattered the mountain, and the fire burnt. And that voice came to him again, and it was still small. 
I don't know the last time the Lord took you by the lapels and rammed you up against the wall and said, you don't listen to me! It's never happened. It's always a small voice. It's always a still small voice. Maybe you'll call it something else, but it's conscience. It's that whisper in the back of your head that says, don't do that. And it's never, don't do that. It's never like that. It's always, you better watch it, bud. And so I want to say that for a long time, Moses had a conscience about this thing God was dealing with him about. And now, finally, he's come to the day that the conscience meets the consequences. And he says, uh, now tell me again, why are you here? And he sings the, sings the same old song. And he said, you just lost your job. So I don't know how long the Lord has to tell me over and over again what I should do or not do, that I just kind of blare right on through. But one day, it'll cost you something. I'm not trying to threaten you. No, I'm just saying, all else fails, we all wind up at the judgment seat of Christ with stuff that's not covered as it should be covered and you know, repented of it, it should be. And so there's an answering for it. It's, there's a recompense for it at some point. And the Lord says, that's holy ground to me. Same holy ground Moses had stood on, Elijah's standing on. Just a different lesson, but it's a holy lesson. And the Lord says, I am dead serious about you listening to my voice, even when it doesn't sound like the roaring of waters. <laughs> Niagara Falls. <laughs> I want you to listen to me when I whisper. Because usually, I whisper. When the Lord says, uh, whom seekest thou? Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, I'm he. He didn't say, I am he! <laughs> Boom! You know, I'm he. Yeah. You don't have to holler. Yeah. And he shouldn't have to holler for you. Amen. He shouldn't have to holler for me. It's where... Conscience meets consequences. And then you got Jesus Christ. Take your Bible to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. This is the Mount of Temptation. And uh, again, uh, typologically, I believe it has to be Mount Sinai. I've heard other Bible commentators say it's not. Maybe it's not, but fits for me, and this preaches out real good, so Amen. Matthew 4, verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, don't forget Sinai, Horeb, is in a wilderness, right, to, the, uh, to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, don't forget that Moses and uh, Elijah both fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And don't, aren't those three guys kind of linked together prophetically? Yes. Don't they wind up, you know, Jesus Christ goes up on the Mount of Temptation, which may be the same mount. Peter later says it's the Holy Mount. By the way, what's said there is, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You'll tie that together here in a second. And Peter says, we heard those words on the Holy Mount. I think it's Sinai. You say, I don't agree. Okay, just be quiet. Because <laughs> I'm going to preach this out. It's my sermon, okay? If I'm wrong, I'll answer for it. I think it's Sinai. And it goes on to say in verse 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God. Notice he repeats that in verse 6, the second temptation, if thou be the Son of God. Satan comes and says, if thou be the Son of God. Satan knows he's the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, Jesus Christ knows he's the Son of God. Yeah. So what's the question? Yeah. Well, 
something's going on here at this mount. It's where Satan challenges sonship. Because Satan knew he was the son of God. And Jesus knew he was the son of God. And God knew he was the son of God. This is a challenge. So he says in verse uh, 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And uh, the devil had to do something else then. Okay, where are we then? Well, Jesus Christ comes to this holy ground. I think it's Mount Sinai. I think it's Mount Horeb. And there he squares off with Satan. And plainly, the key in Satan's mind is the challenge, if thou be the Son of God. Now, there's all kinds of preaching in this passage, as you well know, but there are several things that lend themselves here. First of all, the first challenge, I have to go through these quickly because we don't have all night, but in verse 3, the tempter came and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Okay, now he's challenging his sonship, if thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God, do something to help yourself. There's clearly a need. You've been without food for 40 days and 40 nights, you're weak. Hey, everybody's got to eat. This is within your power to do. So since you have the grace and the liberty and power to do it, go ahead and do it. That's the challenge. If thou be the Son of God, you know full well you can do this. So do something for yourself. Do something precipitously. Do something presumptuously. Do something where, you know, you don't have to wait on God anymore. You've waited long enough. It's time to eat. <laughs> so go ahead. Do it. I mean, you have the liberty. You have the latitude. You can drink and be saved. You can marry somebody that's unsaved and still be saved. You can take a job in a faraway place where there's no church and make $50,000 more a year than you make today. You know, uh, be yourself. <laughs> Go for it. Uh-oh, it's right. And the question is, uh, if thou be the Son of God, you should do that. And he could have done that. But he didn't. Say, how does that apply to me? You have the latitude and the liberty to do a lot of things. The question is, as a son of God, should you? Because you'll still be saved if you do. Jesus Christ was still going to be the Son of God no matter what he did. But... And it's not, I'm not saying, by the way, in the fundamentalist line of thinking that if you do it, that only proves that you're not the Son of God. <laughs> but rather, I'm saying, should a Son of God do that? Yeah. Maybe that's what you should ask yourself. Because yeah. this is where Satan challenges sonship. He says, go ahead. Go for it. Nike swoosh, the whole thing. <laughs> go for it. Just do it. No fear. You realize how ingrained that is in our culture? Yeah. Even Christian culture. Yeah. I mean, do it for yourself. Don't you want to be happy? God does. Ta-da, and off it goes. Just, just do it. Yeah. Um, the question is, since the Son of God didn't do it, mm. should you? Yeah. And you say, uh, there's not a list of rules on the wall. There, you know, there's just a lot of things in the Bible that aren't covered. Yeah. I mean, they're covered in precept, yeah. but they're not covered, you know, incidentally. Yeah. And we should be able to answer right on some of those things that, right. no, as a son of God, I shouldn't do that. Right. Yeah. Because if my son did it to me, mm. I'd feel bad about it. So the Lord doesn't hold it over our heads like an anvil. But I'm still a son of God. He's been awfully good to me. Amen. So the real question is, should I, as a son of God, do it? There's the 
second point here. To go on down to verse uh, 5. The devil taketh him up into a holy, the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, there it is again, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee a promise from the Scriptures, although a little bit twisted, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said, It is written, <laughs> Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Um, you know, force God's hand. You're eternally secure. It's not going to affect your salvation. Force God's hand. You know, he's still, he'll still, you'll still be saved even when you do this. You know, it's like that. Um, people do that all the time. But should they? Because with all that liberty that all the mega churches talk about and all the grace that all the mega churches talk about, that they use that for license to do what they want to do to serve their own flesh. But should a child of God do it? That's, it's not a question of whether there's a rule written in the Holy Scriptures that forbids it. That's really not the issue sometimes. Sometimes the issue is, but should I? It's a whole different ball game. I got to move on here. Look down in verse 8 where he says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. And this time he doesn't challenge the sonship, but he's already done it twice, right? And uh, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Okay. Um, let the devil do something for you. And you say, What is that? Well, it could be a lot of things, but there's something that bugs me a little bit. I'm a patriot, I love America. Man, I'm glad I'm born here. Amen. I'm glad I'm not born in Malawi. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we have, a, we have a colored lady in our church that went with us to, uh, to Malawi, and she said, I just want to thank God for the North, America, North Atlantic slave trade, because <laughs> she was glad not to be born there, and glad to have been born in America. Uh, I'm not trying to offend anybody, so if you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> Brother Josh didn't know I was going to say that. But, you know, I'm a little irked at times, because... You hear a lot about the American dream. And that ideal is a secular ideal that a lot of our forebears came to this country from far away in poverty and all kinds of wretchedness and worked their fingers to the bone and over a period of one generation or five established themselves and uh, we are now a land of you got more food than you can eat in your fridge at home in a week. You have more clothes than you can wear in a week. Most people don't. But the American dream has also become this, this phantasm where I'm supposed to be able to work hard, retire, make my millions of dollars, retire when I'm 50, and live it up. And God never promised you that. You have great liberty, and we have... Great riches. But God never promised you the American dream. That is not Scripture. Uh, you are supposed to, with food and raiment, be there with content. And so what we do sometimes is we allow, as Americans, I speak of to Americans, we go and jump off into that rat race and let money and career and education, and fun, yeah. and all those other things dictate to us how we should live yeah. without thinking twice yeah. about the fact that the Christian life is supposed to be a sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. I simply say, let the devil give you something. Yeah, but should you? If you've got a great job and love it, I'm glad for you. I don't, I don't have an ugly thing to say. But you do know you can serve that if you're not careful. Yeah. You do know that that's easily inverted into being in front of God. Amen. The money that you have earned and the money you're retiring on, that easily can become your focus. Yeah. And you say, what are you saying? 
I am saying that Satan challenges sonship. And among other things, let the devil do something for you. Now, I'll give you all this stuff if you'll just run the race with the rest of the rats. And uh, the question is, should a son do that? It's not will you be lost if you do. Right. It's whether it's, it's what Jesus did. Yeah. You know, what would Jesus do? Yeah. Most people that wear the bracelet have not the slightest clue what Jesus would do. Because they haven't read the Bible. The Jesus they serve is not the Jesus of the Bible at all. But um, Satan challenges sonship. Should a son do what the world, the flesh, and the devil is asking you to do. And the last thing is this, Galatians chapter 1. We've looked at Moses, whose crops collided with his commission. The Lord said, The ground on which thou standest is holy ground. For Elijah, um, his conscience met with consequences. And he was standing on the same ground that Moses stood on. In Jesus Christ's case, Satan comes to that mount and challenges his sonship. And Jesus Christ stood against the devil on every occasion Amen. of that. Standing, I believe, on the same ground Moses and Elijah stood on. And then there's this. We know about Paul, I think. You all probably know the story and how it went, but Galatians chapter 1 and go on down to verse 12, Galatians 1, 12. For I neither received it of man, the revelation from God, neither was, it taught, uh, neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my con conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and, it prof and, and profited, rather, in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, uh, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him uh, among the, the heathen immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem, but to them, rather, which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Paul went to Arabia. Sinai is in Arabia. He mentions Sinai later in Galatians 4. I have every reason to believe that Paul went to Horeb, just like Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, and received this revelation that nobody in the Old Testament could dig out or find because it was new stuff. And the stuff about your eternal security, you're being made a part of the body of Christ when you get saved. A circumcision made without hands, that stuff was all brand new stuff. I mean, Paul's sitting up there on that mount at some juncture after his, and he's going, whoa. <laughs> and I, you know, I got to uh, start, you know, closing this down here a little bit, but saved in Acts 9. And then baptized in Acts 9. And then pretty quickly thereafter, the Lord escorting him away to Arabia, where I believe he went to Sinai. And maybe it was 40 days and 40 nights, for all I know. Sets him down there and teaches him Bible. <laughs> teaches him Bible that hadn't even been written yet. <laughs> and Paul is sitting there going, man, wow, this is good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> but there's a second thought that came with it. And the second thought is, Gamaliel is not going to be happy. <laughs> Gamaliel was the Pharisee that taught Paul yeah. how to be a Pharisee. Yeah. He's going, oh man. I mean, for a while it was really good. Then he started thinking about Gamaliel and the rest of the Pharisees and the nation of the Jews <laughs> and how this was going to fly. And he's going, oh boy. <laughs> right? Put a little bit of a curb on that glory part, you know. And you know what that is? That's where revelation clashes with relationship. That's where 
you are, you're saved. You can go home to mama. Because mama's going to want to get saved too. And mama don't want nothing to do with it. And grandpapa don't want anything to do with it either. And your Catholic priest and Methodist lesbian pastor aunt, they don't want nothing to do with it either. And here you sit with this vast, this great treasure you've realized, and your own family hates you for it. And the friends that you knew at work, that you hung out with and did Friday nights with, they ain't all that happy either. Turns out everybody doesn't want to get saved like you. Turns out everybody doesn't even want to hear about the Bible unlike you. And with that then flows reproach, which is something Christians hate today, that there would be backlash by friends, family, sometimes wives and husbands and children and aunts and uncles and Thanksgivings get really uncomfortable and Christmases get really uncomfortable and suddenly you're not invited to all the family gigs anymore. You know what that is? You know what that is? That's, that is revelation clashing with relationship. And if Paul is sitting on Mount Sinai, he's sitting on the same ground as Moses, Elijah, and Jesus Christ. Each of those men are individuals, and there's prophetic implications to all of it, but it's also personal and devotional for us. In one case, it's where your crops collide with your commission. In the next case, it's your conscience meeting up with consequence. In the next case, it's Satan challenging your sonship. You know, if you're the son of God, you can do this. Yeah, but should you? Because Jesus Christ didn't. And the fourth one is Paul, where the magnitude of this revelation is washing over him. I mean, it's just, oh, can't even believe this is true. This is sweet. <laughs> and man, he goes and tries to tell somebody, gets it in the neck. Paul lost his head for preaching the gospel. And he said, we are the off-scouring of the world. And so, ladies and gentlemen, those four grounds for us devotionally, it's, it's still doctrinally true. But for us devotionally, through those four men, that is holy ground, that is precious ground for God Maybe you should kick the sho- your shoes off your feet. And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you tonight for a chance to stand and preach again. And I pray that, uh, Lord, uh, you'd bless the next service to come. I pray you'd help us to be able to absorb everything tonight and have it to still think on tomorrow afresh. Uh, Lord, we uh, need you. We know that we are uh, inclined to failure. And just pitiful service. We can't count how many times we've disappointed you. And especially with things of this nature tonight, um, Lord, uh, we, like a couple of these men, um, have failed. But I pray you might help us to lift our eyes to the horizon and to have a vision, Father, for doing it right. And uh, Moses was successful by the grace of God. And so was Elijah. And Jesus Christ, it goes without saying. And Paul, our apostle, uh, he overcame so much. I pray you'd help us to realize what's holy ground to thee. And I pray you'd help us to successfully maneuver some of that ground. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.